go ahead and echo what David has already said. Um, putting this together is hard work. I'm talking about being a, a father. And so, yeah, there was a lot of tears shed as I, as I crafted this thing. So I think I've got them out of the way, but um, we'll see. We'll see what happens. So a few weeks ago, usually if, you, if you're a member here, you know that I usually sit on this side of the sanctuary. You know, we're, we're creatures of comfort and creatures of habit. So I usually sit over here, but because of the way worship was set up that morning, I found myself sitting on this side. And it was kind of one of those God, divine providence kind of things because as I was sitting there, and it was right at the chiming of the hours, Luther Hunter walks in on this side. And really, since I've been here, I don't know if Luther ever called me Justin. He never did that. Um, he always called me Fuzzy Dude. And he would sit there and say, whether it was a deacon's meeting or in the hallway, he'd see me coming and he'd say, hey there, Fuzzy Dude. And it was just this ongoing joke that we had. And so that morning, he enters the door and he has this, he sees me and we make eye contact and he has this kind of smile on his face and his Probably that kind of smile that he's had since he was about four or five years old. And uh, I can see that boyish grin. And he comes up to me, and, and you know everything's chiming, and we're getting ready to start worship. And he puts his hand on my shoulder, and he says, I bet you knew that boy wasn't going to shave yesterday that morning for that wedding, didn't you? And I laughed because I knew immediately what he was talking about. He was talking about the royal wedding. And the thing that you know, a lot of people were worried and they didn't know it, was Prince Harry going to shave and was he not going to shave? And there was all these questions that were surrounding that because you know, media talks about really important things. And so they were really worried about this guy shaving or not. And so he told me this joke and we laughed. And I just, you know, in that moment, I just appreciated his humor um, and kind of bringing that to attention. There was a lot of things they talked about before the royal wedding. Lauren and I got up to watch it. And as we went through it, we were watching it from the BBC and they were answering all these questions. But after... It was over. Most of the attention, at least I felt like, was given to one particular issue. Now, they talked about the guests that showed up that day. They talked about, you know, what people wore and everything else. But a lot of people talked about the sermon that was preached that day. That got a lot of attention. The sermon was given by a man named Michael Curry. I've been fortunate enough to meet him many years ago. Lauren, got to meet, Lauren and I got to meet him in Greensboro. But Michael Curry uh, is the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church excuse me, Episcopal Church. He used to be over just North Carolina, and then he became the first African-American to hold that position on a national level. His message that day, as the world watched, because you know, everybody was tuning in, either tuning in or tuning out to watch this thing, his message was very simple. And it was only 13 minutes, but it really caught the attention of just about everybody. And it was a simple message. And people, I kept, they're like, oh, it was so powerful. And I'm like, Man, we talk about this every week in church. This is nothing new, but his message was one of love and the importance of love in the world today. So I encourage you to watch the whole thing, but this is one snippet. This is what Bishop Curry has to say about love. He says, oh, there's power, power in love, not just in romantic forms, but in any form, any shape of love. There's a certain sense in which you are loved and you know it when someone cares for you and you know it. When you love and you show it, it actually feels right. Now, Bishop Curry is not the first person to ever talk about love or to try to give, you know, you know, language to what love actually is. You know, I think humanity has tried to do that since, uh, and since we've been around. Um, I, you know, I think about the movie Dead Poet Society and Robin Williams uh, in that movie. He plays a professor in a New England prep school, and he's talking to these young men, and he's sitting around, and he's like, you know why men write love poems? And all these kids are giving him answers, and he goes, wrong. It's to woo women. That's why they write love poems. But we have, as a culture, as just a people, as, you know, as human beings, we have been talking about love for a long time. And so here are some, this is what people have said down through the generations. William Shakespeare, considered by many to be the greatest playwright and poet who ever lived, once said, When love speaks, the voice of all the gods makes heaven drowsy with harmony. James Baldwin, novelist and social critic, When you love one human being, you see everyone else very differently than you saw them before. Perhaps I only mean to say that you begin to see, and you are both stronger and more vulnerable, both free and bound. Now, I thought, now, I'm going to quote the Beatles here. You know, I mean, the Beatles said, all you need is love. 
but in a more modern context, you know, a, a more modern English folk kind of rock band named Mumford and Sons, in one of their first songs that became a big hit, they have these lyrics that say, Love will not betray you, dismay, or enslave you. It will set you free to be more like the man you were made to be. There is a design and alignment to cry of my heart to see the beauty of love as it was made to be. Now, whether it's the Mumford and Son boys or it's James Baldwin or if it's Billy Shakespeare, you know, they're talking about this in a very romantic, kind of like a very lofty idea of love. But I think those who have experienced love, they know that it can come, it can crash into you, that love can feel chaotic. And so that's why I like Maya Angelou, the poet and civil rights activist and former Wake Forest professor. She says, love is like a virus. It can happen to anybody at any time. And so I think as a, as a people, as a church people, as a people of God, there is a certain freedom we have both as individuals and as part of a larger collective when we speak about love. Part of the Christian faith tradition is seeing love manifest itself into this incarnate being. The Gospels give us this story of the God-man, the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. So being in the season of Pentecost, we go this morning to John's Gospel a retelling of the life of Jesus unlike the previous three. In chapter 14, Jesus is explaining to his disciples, and it always seems that he's having to explain something. It's this repetitive act that he has to keep doing, but he's explaining to his disciples the promise of an act of an expression of love that's coming. It's what the King James translation calls the comforter. Now, I like the idea of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit being seen as comforting. However, in the original Greek, perhaps a better understanding would be counselor. This interpretation brings together notions of the Holy Spirit both as being tender and patient, but also one that encourages and rekindles. A counselor who promises those that believe that while today may be hard, that circumstances might seem bleak, we as a people get a chance to rise again much like the sun in the sky to start afresh a new day. This kind of spirit, a spirit rooted in love, is a strong spirit, one that replenishes those who are thirsty and restores those who are broken. Not only does the spirit empathize with us, but it's the spirit that comes with us and acts. Now, near the end of the chapter, in verse 20, Jesus explains the wondrous complexity of this new kind of a loving relationship the counselor brings, a relationship that confirms Christ's presence in his disciples and in those who believe. But it doesn't stop there. The Spirit also displays the loving affair that links all believers back to God the Father. Christ essentially says that on that day, when the Spirit of love, of a loving God, descends upon my people, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. And this new relationship, this new expression of love, is something to be felt and shared in the present. This love houses itself in the heart of every believer. This is where the living, loving hearts of flesh are transformed into God's new home. Now, clearly up to this moment, these disciples got to be thinking, we've got a pretty good handle on what's going on here. We know what love looks like. They had grown up being the chosen people of God. They were God's people. So they had their respected faith that they are bringing along with them. And then they've been called by this young mystical carpenter who performed miracles and talked of the coming kingdom of heaven that was there, right there. They saw his love towards them. And yet now, after this conversation, they saw a completely new understanding of love revealing itself through the coming of the Spirit. All the questions, all the lessons Jesus had been teaching them and just when they think they're starting to figure it out, boom, the spirit of love arrives in a mighty wind and changes everything. I've had a moment like that. I've had several, but I've had a new one recently. When you think you've got things figured out and everything changes. Lauren and I have been married now for five years and we've known each other just shy of a decade and through her, I have felt a love I've never, I never knew before, 
And just about the time I thought, which is probably foolish, that I was getting this marriage thing figured out, here comes the baby. This is the hard part. Inner violet. She came into the world like we all do. Up from the depths she arose from a baptism of water and blood, a shared act we humans never really recover from. You know, in the movies, they kind of paint this picture of how it's going to be in the hospital and what to expect. And um, it's all very, it's, it's a lot of comedy, it's a lot of laughing. Sometimes it's not like that. It's scary. Um, it's, it's different. It's something that I had never been in before. And, and, but some of the stuff still rings true. Like when, when Violet was born, she was, you know, they, they come up and they bring her and they showed her to us. And then she was swick, uh, quickly swept away to an adjacent table where she was cleaned, she was weighed, and she was promptly beat the hell out of. <laughs> At least that's the way it looked to a new father. I was like, what is going on over there? Like, it just looked rough. So she, they, but I know now they were just massaging her in the hopes of coaxing her along to take in air and push it out. And she, she cried. She, she was strangely quiet, um, something that she really hasn't been since. <laughs> um, but after sucking out all the fluid, she was swaddled and handled to me in this small toboggan. If there's anybody from the north, it's not a sled, it's a hat. Um, but I just remember them giving her to me, and she had this little bit of fur. <laughs> That's what it looked like, this little bit of hair that stuck out the back. That was my first real image of her. Now, let me be clear. I had been a father for all about two minutes, but I knew she was perfect. You know, they put this stuff on their eyes so they don't, um, you know, it's, it's to help with infections or, you know, it's a, it's, a, you know, it's a medical thing, which means I don't know anything about it. But they put this stuff on her eyes. And she looked at me through these smeared eyes. And in that moment, our bond was sealed. She was half of me, and yet she held all of me. Holding her, I leaned in to show Lauren, bringing her close so she could see a face that looked so much like her own. Lauren was still being attended to by medical staff, so I, the most unprepared for this moment, was left to hold Violet in my right arm while simultaneously placing my other hand on Lauren. I've told this to some people that I've talked to about, you know, Violet being born, but you talk about a moment of just realized helplessness, where you just don't have any control over anything. If you ever want to experience that, just have a baby. Just, have, just become a father. Afterward, you're still kind of reeling. Um, Lauren and I were being moved from the birthing room to recovery unit, and we had this short moment to ourselves in the hallway. And I tried to choke back tears that flowed effortlessly. Some tears of joy, but mostly tears of concern for her. Going through this had solidified how much Lauren means to me. And I don't mean to sound cliche, but while I know it would be possible, I can't imagine doing life without her. She has simply become a part of me that I recognize as the best of me. Now, a lot has happened since that moment, since the hospital, that moment of incarnate love showing up, where I transitioned from being a husband to a father. We're here four months later. Violet's still alive, which is a good sign. She cries, she eats, she poops, and she laughs, and she smiles. Some people say there's the crying of a baby that breaks them. But for me, it's her smile. There's a wonder and hope found in those moments. There is a swelling of compassion that causes me to question all the artificial moments I've tried to create in my life over the years. This child is real. The love I have for her and her mother is real. Being able to experience what it means to be a father is a gift of love in the holiest of sense. It's this holy, set-apart, God-sized love which makes me question this morning any legislation, any policy or law that would separate fathers and mothers from their children. You know, I went away to a conference this past week, and I knew that's why I'm going down to Look Up Lodge a little bit, away, a little bit late, but I'm, I went to this conference for a solid week, and it was on the second day that, you know, Lauren and I usually just talk on the phone, but since a baby, you kind of have to do FaceTime. And I'm sitting there in this kind of cabin in the woods, and I call Lauren on this FaceTime, and one of the first things I see when it opens up is I see Violet. And I knew I was going home that night. I would, get, I would go home just enough time to eat and go to sleep and get back up at 6 o'clock the next morning and drive back to that conference. I just needed to be home because it physically hurt me 
to be separated from her. That's what love looks like. Love is driving home and making those sacrifices. Love is when you get home, it's not sleeping on a mattress. You know, we bought a new mattress right before Violet was born, and we've never slept on it. Never have. I can't even tell you what it feels like. Lawrence co-sleeps with her in this huge, wonderful recliner that her mother got us, and I sleep with my head on the couch as closest to them as I get. That's been our life for the past four months. That's love. Love is bouncing around and singing up and, and, and singing silly songs to her and buying clothes with strawberries all over them. It's just, that's what love looks like. Love is kissing the head of a sleepy baby every morning before I leave for work and trying my best not to cry as I walk out the door. I wish I could describe this kind of love to you, but it's really just indescribable. This is the kind of love a father has for his child. And I believe it's kind of to God love too. God's love, this new covenant through Christ, is a unifying action that fulfills and surpasses all other would-be laws of the land. We not only know this through scripture, but because of this spirit of love, we can actually feel it. Now my father is here this morning, and it is because of him that I began to practice something a while ago that I hope will be a reminder to Violet as she gets older of this spirit of love that I, as her father, have for her now. Growing up, my dad always told me how proud he was of me. And there were some times where he had no business telling me that. Um, it's a great testimony story, but I, had, I was in my 20s and fresh out of crazy, and I made some horrible decisions. But in those moments, my father never shamed me. And he always told me how proud he was of me, even when I didn't deserve it. Now, in the last 10 years, I, you could say I got my act together. I mean, some people may argue that, but I kind of got it together. But I went to school. I you know, graduated. I'm at Wake Forest University. I got married to a wonderful woman. I have this beautiful child. And now when he tells me he's proud, it kind of makes sense. But I remember being in the hospital right after Violet was born, and I'm sitting there um, in one of the rooms, and my dad says, son, this is the greatest thing you've ever done. Out of all my accomplishments, that child walking back there, well, she's not walking, but my wife is carrying her around. That child is the greatest thing I've ever done. So what I do every few mornings, Lauren's still asleep, she sleeps with the baby. I get up early, and I write in the journal to Violet. And like my father, I encourage her in the same spirit of love. I tell her I believe in her, that she is complete, whole, and perfect. And that I'm proud of her. I tell her this, too, because of, because of the God's, God's love that's within me. I tell you all this morning because that same love is in you, too.